For those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Jez. Um, I'm uh, the co-founder of Ogilvy Change with Rory. And um, I'm quite different to Rory. Um, he's from the south. I'm from the north. Um, he's incredibly fashionable. Clearly, I'm not. Um, and um, he talked a lot. Um, and um, I won't talk as much in between uh, the different speakers. So we will keep to time. And, um, but um, have we enjoyed this morning? Has everyone enjoyed this morning so far? Yeah, can we have a round of applause, please? Thank you. Um, so um, Rory asked me to do that to maintain the consistency principle. So, um, so I just would like to give you a little bit of feedback um, because this is being streamed worldwide and we've had some really interesting tweets. Um, so we've got a tweet from Al Flynn who's really enjoying Nudge Doc, particularly as he's watching from the comfort of his deck chair in his garden. Um, we've got um, a tweet from John Sills who says there's a big group of people looking lost at Deal Station. Maybe they could benefit from using the herding heuristic. And um, in terms of the, the guys, so you've seen the work that Tim and the team are doing, that um, uh, Mary Bow is loving the live sketch artist at Nudgestock. And then the final one from, from Khaled um, is um, it's great to listen to different theories, um, but it will get even more interesting when the practical part starts. And I, I think that's quite interesting in terms of the way that myself and Rory work, that um, I've dedicated a lot of my time in the last two and a half years with the team um, to actually do things. Um, and... Um, I think that's, that's the theme. We just want to just make sure that everybody is on, on board with the direction that we're headed with behavioral science. That what we're not saying is that we need necessarily to talk less that much. We just need to do a lot more things. I was chatting to Jules this morning, and um, it may be something that you echo in terms of Jules's uh, presentation, that we often think to do. Uh, and actually, Jules was really insightful and said, actually, no, I think we need to do more do to think. Uh, and that's the theme of, of the next 15 minutes. And um, this is kind of a famous uh, statistic that is often bandied around within behavioral science. And it's about subconscious decision making. And um, if you have a look on Google and you have a look on the internet, it's actually not very well substantiated that 90 to 95% of decisions are made subconsciously. So no one's actually done the meta-analysis of all the different types of decisions and really got under the skin to understand which of these decisions are subconscious. So I think I'd like to be equally spurious um, and maybe provocative to say that actually I think this is the ratio that we currently are exhibiting, that we're just talking a lot, okay? And, and hopefully what we're going to do today is drive a new agenda where actually we're going to uh, redress the balance. So that's what I'm going to talk about uh, for the next 10 minutes. Now, the, the reason why uh, we have to do this is because I think we're at a critical point. So I think Dan referenced the article that was in the, Gar in the Guardian or the Observer this weekend. Um, and this is what Tim said. Though nudge economics remains seductive, what once seemed like a panacea has come to look a bit more like a series of sticking plasters. Now, that is quite a powerful driving force for me and hopefully for people in the room. And um, I kind of experienced this around about two and a half years ago. And um, those of you might remember that a year ago, um, in the first Nudge Talk, I came uh, and talked about the first kind of founding client piece of what we did. Um, we worked with News UK. They're the owner of the Times and the Sunday Times. We've got some, some of the people here today. And Katie Vanek-Smith and Chris Duncan were our clients. And they made a huge leap of faith. They wanted to work with us and apply some of these heuristics and biases to essentially get people to change their behavior from buying a newspaper every day to essentially becoming a subscriber and now a member to the Times for a whole year. And that was quite challenging. So we took on board and we changed the choice architecture. We changed the relative frame. We utilized um, some quite interesting pricing techniques. And um, we were quite proud of the work. Um, and um, the ROIs were significant. And, um, but there was another driving force that, that, that came to me on that day, and it was this. Um, there was a tweet from Greg Davis, um, and he said, it's a spurious example of a missing £2 saving. It's muddy thinking. So that was kind of tweeted on the day and then retweeted by Joe Gladstone. And I, I kind of took that as a positive force to go, actually, I think you're right. I think, actually, I'm very, very confident this is a very strong commercial case study, but it's beholden on me and the people in this room to actually start to build some strong evidence and cases behind this. And um, so, you, as you can imagine, when I saw this tweet, my initial kind of system one reaction was kind of like this, swear a lot. So my Homer Simpson was just basically utilizing every swear word that I learned throughout my whole life, which I've got quite a few. Um, and when I ran out of swear words, I then got to gestures um, and, and utilized all of those. 
So um, there's a big driving force at the moment, which I think is really interesting, which is around System 1. But there's a lot of growing momentum, essentially around System 2, I believe, which is about understanding um, how we can be more reflective in our thinking. So I don't know enough about it yet, but I'm very, very intrigued to, to learn more about mindfulness and about actually taking time to reflect. So breathing out and taking seven seconds to do that um, is going to help me become more mindful of the experiences that, that I experience, but also is also going to thicken, essentially, the right side of my prefrontal cortex. And um, so I went through this period of reflection um, um, after the tweet. And like any, um, I suppose, uh, person that's, that likes listening to, I suppose, deeper thinkers, I went to two quite famous philosophers um, of mine that got me, uh, got me through this. And the first one was Kelly Clarkson. Um, and she had this brilliant, brilliant piece of, of advice, um, which is, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And I thought, yes, Kelly, I'm with you. I'm with you on that. <laughs> so, so that was kind of the first thing. But I still needed further help, so I went to the second uh, great philosopher. Um, and that was Princess Elsa from Frozen. And she said, Jez, just let it go. Let it go. And here I stand, uh, and here I'll stay. And um, so I am still here. Um, and, and thank you for the tweet, because I think it's been fantastic in terms of driving force for us as a business um, to develop more case studies. And I just want to spend um, a little bit of time talking through talking through um, a number of different case studies. And um, so um, the first thing is um, we've been really quite busy in the last 12 months. And um, so we've been working with over 40 clients. Um, and today on SlideShare, you'll be able to see um, six of the case studies which we're able to publish. Um, the first one is the spurious and muddy thinking, um, but the client is very, very pleased with exceptional commercial uh, results, which was the Times Choice Architecture, which you can uh, read at your leisure. The second one was some work we did for BT Business Broadband, uh, where we were given quite a difficult challenge, which was just change, essentially, some copy in an email. And by changing, uh, essentially, the paragraphs and the size of the paragraphs, uh, we drove response rates by 47%. We tried to do some norming work, um, and it had no effect at all. We did some work with PHE, um, and we helped people get off their couch and getting people to walk and run, so I know Matt's in the audience today. And um, what we're very good in advertising and communications is using hyperbole, so 40 million meters is a big number, um, but if you work that out in terms of kilometers, it's a bit smaller. Um, <laughs> one big number that I really, really like, so those of you familiar with Kickstarter, um, the first ever, uh, essentially, project to be funded on Kickstarter uh, was Emily. Um, and essentially, she kind of wanted to, I suppose, uh, uh, extol the virtues of, of tea um, in the face of ongoing uh, competition from coffee. And she's got um, a, a little tea van which she has in King's Cross. And um, we worked with her um, and developed a number of, of I, I, little ideas and interventions. And one of them was essentially around demystifying tea and making it easy for people to buy tea. Because if I said to all of you in the room, can you tell me the difference between Darjeeling and Assam and Ceylon, you'd find that quite difficult. And actually, that becomes a barrier for you ordering it. So we provided some norms in this case. 53% uh, of our customers yesterday chose sale on tea, and we doubled the sales of tea the next day. So all of those are available on SlideShare. Um, and um, one of the case studies that we won an award for in the advertising and marketing uh, uh, events and awards was something which utilized babies' faces on shutters. Um, and Nicole's here today and Tara were absolutely fantastic in, in driving this, where essentially babies' faces produce a caring response in the brain, and that reduced antisocial behavior in uh, an area of Woolwich by 18%. And we're very careful when we present this case study because we're really aware that we've got correlation but not full causality. And I think through all of these case studies, the, the driving force was you just wanted to get better and better and stronger such that our, our thinking would be clearer and more robust. So um, fairly recently, just in the last month, um, Jules and Dan have been to Paris and London and working with Nestle and Perrier. And essentially what we did was we cre created a series of little ideas that we started to test within that environment. And here's a short film to show you what we did.
there you can see um, we dared to be trivial. We did some really, really small things that applied these heuristics in a micro environment in London um, and Paris. And the critical question is, is what actually happened uh, to sales. Um, and in terms of the sales, um, we tracked the base, uh, pre doing some observational work and working with essentially the bar um, and the pubs. In Paris, we double the sales of Perrier, um, and in London, we triple the sales of, of Perrier. Now, what's quite interesting is that we just um, uh, started to employ a lot of psychologists, human geographists, anthropologists who've come straight out of university into Ogilvy Change. And we're starting to apply the same experimental design as you would expect in an academic circle um, into our world. So those of you familiar with inferential statistics will be very, very aware um, about a very, very simple chi-squared test. So we did a chi-squared test. We took the observation versus uh, expected results. We looked at the degrees of freedom. We got a p-value of 0.029504. So there's a one in 30 chance that those sales results being due to chance. So those of you who work generally in advertising and marketing, most were thinking, that's pretty good. Um, chat to a person who's very skilled in inferential statistics. Um, they will say to you, actually, that's more of, more of an amber. So not happy with that. We then did some more work. And we went back to our founding client. We went back to Katie Vanek Smith. We went back to Chris Duncan. And we went back to Sky Rugglers. And what we did is we started to do some work. And um, I think this is a pivotal piece for work, I think, in terms of, uh, of ourselves, but also, hopefully, uh, the behavioral science uh, sector as a whole. And essentially what we did is we had a hypothesis, which is could we go to call centers? So when people are, are ringing um, to actually subscribe and become a member of the Times, could we train call center agents to use behavioral science effectively? So we had um, a hypothesis or, or, and which we wanted to prove. And the methodology was that we did intensive training with six uh, call center teams in Hellaby um, in Yorkshire. So we went out into the field. So Dan talked a lot about designing things with people. What was critical uh, was we co-created essentially um, a lot of the scripting with those individuals. And um, it was just a critical point that I don't think we really, really uh, got a handle on before we went, but as Dan said, incredibly important. We then created, if you like, 576 different types of scripts because everybody had their own way of explaining uh, different ones. I think Haley referred to the card as a discount card, um, which um, I don't necessarily was uh, on, br on brand, but actually was quite, quite effective. Um, we listened, um, or they applied over 4,000 hours of nudge application during the test period uh, over a number of weeks. And uh, we listened to over 18,500 seconds of data. So we had to codify all of that work. Um, and the result was this, that the control, those agents that didn't use heuristics, um, got a quite a good level of sales. But those that did use the heuristics and biases consistently and the ones that they created themselves, um, we got over a 200%, 10% increase um, in sales, which is a threefold increase in sales for those that are good at statistics. And, and, and what was interesting about this is we had more data. So we talked about chi-squared. So those people that are familiar with chi-squared will know that's quite a basic statistical test. But what we were able to do on this was a t-test. And the t-test looks at the variability between the two groups and the variability within the group. And when you apply that t-test methodology, essentially we get a p-value of 0. 0.0002. So, in fact, um, there is a 1 in 5,000 chance that that result was due to chance. So, I think from our perspective, um, what we'd like to do would be that we're so now confident with, with the way that we're using these heuristics and biases with that we'd like to make an offer, so to people in the room, but also people on the live stream, um, that we will do some call center training, we'll offer it for three clients, um, and it'll be on a payment by results basis. And the way that you can access that would be just to simply send me an email, and the first three people that come through with that request will be able to, to, to get that offer. So our agenda is one that hopefully is your agenda, which we want to keep the conversation high, but what we want, need to do is to do a little or even a lot more intervention and really get practical um, and do some work, work out there. I think in terms of where we would be, the way that we've set the agenda today, it's a 50-50 agenda. So we've got a lot of theoretical and a lot of practical um, stuff this, this afternoon. If we get the balance right, then I think actually it's going to be more of a panacea and less uh, about sticking plasters. And then finally, I'm really, really hoping um, that Greg will give us a tweet or something like this today, which is um, trivial and titanium plated nudges that work from Ogilvy Change uh, Nudge Stock 2. <laughs> and Joe, if you're out there, if you could retweet that, I would be very, very pleased. Okay. So um, thank you uh, um, for, uh, for, for listening, for, for essentially for, for hopefully, uh, I suppose, um, a little bit helpful for me uh, in terms of the journey that we've been on in the last year. Um, but you're going to hear a lot uh, more from uh, people this afternoon. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>
So, so and, and, and I genuinely, genuinely mean that. I mean, I think the more that we challenge each other um, with all of this work, I think we've got to prove to the industry uh, and the world out there that actually we can use heuristics and biases for good to make the world a better place. Um, so um, that's me done. I'm going to be um, uh, essentially be talking lesser, less than Rory in between uh, the different uh, speakers. And we've got a really quite interesting group of speakers that are now coming up. What's really quite interesting is when I present those results in terms of the increase that we have in sales and conversion, nobody believes me. And that's why we've had to go through the chi-squared and, and the t-test to make sure that people feel that the, the results um, are indeed uh, ro robust. And, um, and people often think that the things that we do are quite magical, um, and indeed they sometimes feel like that. So what we've got is um, uh, two speakers that are going to follow on from each other. Um, the first one is Rob um, from Goldsmiths, um, and he's um, a member of the Magic Circle, um, and he's done a lot of banquets before. Um, He's a PhD student at Goldsmiths, and he's going to talk about essentially cognitive psychology and magic, and that's going to be quickly followed by Paul Craven, um, who also is a member of the Magic Circle, and the two of them have worked, worked, essentially worked together so that essentially what you're going to get is a, essentially a festival of magic as well as a festival of behavioral science for the next uh, 20 or 30 minutes. Rob. <laughs> 